Welcome. I um, hope you're having a great time. I know I am. My name's JP. I'm from a company called Weviate. Uh, we build a vector database called Weviate. So please come in if you're uh, looking to come in. Fabulous. So today I want to talk to you about vector databases and really what's inside this thing that you probably heard quite a bit about recently. Um, just can I get a show of hands if you have used or heard of at least vector databases? Fabulous. Okay, that's what I like to see. So I'm going to start with this. Vector databases are very, very popular right now. But don't just take my word for it. Let me show you. This is a list of vector databases. Oh, no, wait. This is a list of vector databases that are out in the market. Oh, that's still not quite right. It's actually this. It's quite a list. And if you look at this list, you'll notice that the majority of them have been built since 2020, right? So it's a post, a lot of these are post pandemic babies. So they are very, very popular. But why is that, right? Why are vector databases the hot new thing? One answer is this it's generative AI. It doesn't quite answer the question, though, right? Why does AI require a different type of databases? And more to the point, what makes those databases different to your you know, traditional databases and so on? And I'm sure this is what you're asking, which is, what's in it for me, right? Are these useful? How can I make use of them? So here's what I thought we could do together for the next 25 to 30 minutes. Let's find out if those things are useful by building our own solution. Now, we've only got 25 minutes. I'm sure you're all excellent devs, but you're probably not going to build an entire database in 25 minutes. So we'll just do this conceptually, right? So here's what we're going to do for the next 25, 30 minutes. We're going to build a vector database from scratch. We're going to start really small, essentially from nothing. And we're going to add bits and pieces to it. Hey, JP, why are you making me do this? I'm here for a conference. I'm not here to do work. So hopefully, you can learn some stuff. We all like learning stuff. That's why we're here. But more to the point, I'm hoping that by going through this exercise together, you learn about what these components do. And when you're choosing a vector database from this huge list that you saw earlier, you'll be able to make a better informed choice. So it looks like most of you have used vectors and vector databases. But in case you haven't, I'll go through it very, very quickly. A vector is just a set of numbers. It can be any number, any sort of length of number in any number of dimensions like this. And the question I often get is, hey, why does that matter, right? The reason is that vectors can represent meaning. So if you put vectors and put them into a three-dimensional space like this, a really, really cool magical thing happens. Similar vectors, so similar sets of numbers, like these that are close in space together, show something with similar meaning. But again, so what? Well, it turns out, because you can do this, if you use vector search, you can find contextual information that is extremely powerful for generative AI models. And I'm sure you'll see many talks about retrieval augmented generation today and tomorrow. But as it turns out, using vector search is a great way to perform retrieval augmented generation. So going back to our previous slide about, hey, why are vector databases so tied on with the hype in generative AI? The answer is that vector databases and vector search can help you reduce hallucinations that are quite prevalent, unfortunately, in large language model applications. So hopefully, by now you're very, very convinced of how amazing vectors are and how useful they are to use it with uh, generative AI. So let's get building. We want our own vector database solution, right? So if you want to build a database, you're going to need some data. You know, it might be an image, might be documents, and so on. And of course, we want a vector database. So we're going to have vectors and some sort of metadata with each, with each of these objects. You're going to need to identify what each of these objects are. So we'll add some sort of ID. You're going to have a bunch of them to build a data set. Voila, we can do a bunch of things now. Now we can store our data objects, vectors, and metadata. And this is just like many other types of data store you would have seen already. Could just be a local you know, map, can be a NumPy array or Pandas data frame, what have you. 
Here's our, so we go, okay, we've built a data store, and what do people think? Here's our first problem. Our user says, oh, that's great. I can store a bunch of stuff. But how do we now find objects by similarity? Remember, we said earlier that vectors let us find objects by similarity. Solution one is this. You can just calculate vector similarity by, uh, against a query one by one. So just go, I've got a query vector. How similar is it to this, 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 and so on? And our user says, that's great. It works. But it doesn't quite scale. It doesn't quite do what I need to do. Because adding now, if I have 10 times as many objects, it takes 10 times as long, 100 times as many objects, and so on. So here's our first challenge. How do we scale search? And the answer is indexes. You're probably familiar with the concept of indexes, right? So it's a catalog of data, like something from the back of a book, at a library, and so on. And the primary purpose of an index, just like an index at the back of a book, is to speed up search. Right? And you would have seen this in relational databases and so on in the form of an inverted index. And an inverted index organizes information by property, metadata, and so on. And what it is typically is a table of token counts. Right? So if you're coming from an NLP background, you'd have seen TF-IDF tables. Right? So it's basically counts of terms. And that helps you perform faster keyword searches, which is very, very useful. So it captures how often certain terms or tokens or phrases appear versus how often they should appear in overall um, corpus. So you can find documents where those terms appear um, where based on their relevance. Great. So that's an inverted index. Nothing new. But what do we do about vectors? How can we find vectors quickly? Well, vectors capture meaning. So we now we have to find some way of organizing this information by similarity so that we can speed up search. And there's a bunch of different types of vector uh, indexes. So you'll see terms like flat indexes, graph-based indexes, tree-based, and others. Right? So these are just different data structures that will help you perform vector search faster and faster. The one thing you need should know about vector indexes is that they are approximate. So it's not a thorough 100% recall search, but they're most of the times approximate. And that's because you're making these trade-offs. They're typically between speed of search, how accurate your search is, mostly measured in recall, and your memory requirement, which we'll talk about more in depth. The simplest form of an index is just what's called a flat index. It's different from, uh, you'll see some disambiguation with flat indexes from time to time, but what I'm talking about is just a brute force flat index. It's essentially a map structure. Because it's a simple structure, it has very little overhead, and it's just performing linear search through your data set. And this is great for small scale because of the low overhead and because computers are very fast. You can do this very quickly up to a certain size data set, maybe 10,000, 100,000 objects, and so on. But it doesn't scale, right? We have the same problem. So what's very popular these days are graph-based indexes. So these are very, very common. And the most common type is what's called HNSW, which we'll get into in just a second. The reason that, 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 the reason that these are very popular is because they are scalable. And they scale logarithmically in terms of search time. But there is a drawback. Nothing's perfect. So the trade-off you're making here is that they are typically a little bit more memory intensive and your memory footprint becomes a bottleneck quite often. There are, of course, other index types as well. There's, you'll see terms like ANNOY, which I still think is an amazing acronym. Um, it stands for Approximate Nearest Neighbor, oh yeah, I believe, which is a great flex if you can name things like that. And these have you know, different benefits, different data structures and so on, but generally they're not as scalable as HNSW, so they're not as popular these days. So we decide to you know, add HNSW index to our database. So let's understand a little bit more about how they work and what we can tune about them. What it is is a layered graph structure. So the lowest layer of an HNSW has all your vectors or nodes in your graph, and they are all going to be connected. Um, not entirely, like not every node is connected to every other node, but a node each node is connected to some number of neighbors. And as you go up in the structure, you get subsets of nodes. You get some sort of decay function, so you have fewer nodes as you go up in the layers. 
why does this matter? That means that as you go higher, you have fewer and fewer nodes, and that means you can traverse through this network of graphs or network of nodes, excuse me, faster. If you're from a computer science background, um, you can maybe analogize this as like a multi-dimensional skip list. So that's like a good intuitive way to think about it. Basically, it's just a set of shortcuts that'll help you get to the right region of the graph faster and traverse from there. And there's a bunch of parameters that you can tune, which is good to know because our users might want flexibility. There's this thing called max connections or M, and what that determines is how many nodes each node is going to be connected to or up to a number. So it can be a certain number like 16 to 64 typically. And on the bottom, because you have more nodes and you want more thorough retrieval, you, have, you tend to have more connections on the bottom layer. The trade-off you're making off here with this parameter is that of memory versus accuracy, right? You can imagine the more nodes, you, sorry, more edges you have, the more accurate and thorough your search is going to be, but of course it's going to take more memory. Great. This other parameter called EF. So it's the size of candidate list that you have as you traverse through the graph and your top K results will come from that. And here your trade-off is mainly speed versus accuracy. And on the flip side, now assumed, I've assumed up until now that this graph magically exists. Of course it doesn't, right? Um, so you have to build that list or build that graph. And this EF constructions parameter is the EF parameter or your list during graph construction. So here you're again trading off speed versus accuracy, but here you're really trading off the speed of your graph creation, right? Not the search speed, but your graph creation speed for the most part. I mentioned that this tends to have a structure, that tends to be a structure where you're limited by memory. And that's because HNSW graphs are typically in memory. And how big do these things get? So let's do some back of the envelope calculations, right? So each vector, let's assume each dimension is a floating point integer, or sorry, floating point number, is uh, four bytes times whatever number of dimensions, right? So it might be six kilobytes. Pretty small, that's nice. Um, each connection, each sets of connections it might be, you know, some number of 10 bytes, whatever, whatever struct you have. But once you start to have large numbers of nodes, let's say 10 million objects, you're going to need 60-ish gigabytes of memory. At 100 million nodes, or 100 million vectors or objects, you're going to need 650 gigabytes and so on. It really starts to get into large numbers, right? And you know, probably we've seen databases with billions of objects, and that's not uncommon. So you're talking about needing terabytes and terabytes of memory. My computer doesn't quite have that, I don't know about you. It starts to get very, very expensive for our users. What can we do about this? One answer is this. One is quantization. I'm sure many of you are familiar with quantization in machine learning or deep learning context, right, in terms of building the model. You can do the same thing. It's reducing the precision from of the individual uh, nodes. In this case, we're talking about the outputs or the vectors, right? You're quantizing the vector precision. So you can actually, turns out, reduce the, quanti uh, reduce the precision of the numbers from floating points to integers or even binary. And this is kind of always amazing to me that this even works, but it works surprisingly well. You can also reduce the number of dimensions of each vector. So you, if you go have, you know, a thousand dimensions, you can actually reduce that to a small number. And this technique is called product quantization. So if you're looking at a product quantization algorithm, you get two sets of reductions in size. So one is from going from floats to something smaller like integers. And then the other is reducing the number of dimensions to something smaller. So you get the two reductions like so. And doing that, this is a result of some uh, experiment that I ran on my machine. So this is not a stress, not an official benchmark. This is just me just playing around on my device. Um, but with a million objects or so imported, I was using about six gigabytes of memory, as we talked about. With binary or product quantization, I've reduced that down by 60, 60, 70%, right? Just by turning one switch on. And that's great. And as I talked about, if I have a small data set, I can use a flat index, and that uses even less memory. Of course, this isn't free. Nothing's free. Remember, we talked about trade-offs. In this case, you're making the trade-off 
of memory versus accuracy. Can we do something about this? Turns out, yes, we can. What we can do is quite often overfetch our objects and use the full vectors that we still have on disk to compensate. Cool, we're about 15 minutes in. We've done a lot. Um, let's see what we've done. So we started with an object store, and we've got these indexes. So now we can tune these different trade-offs of speed, accuracy, and memory with these knobs of index choice parameters and quantization. Great. And our user says, hey, I've noticed you got these two indexes. That's really cool. Can we use them together to do, I don't know, something? Um, turns out there's things you can do when you have those two indexes that are very, very cool. One is filtering. Filtering is just matching criteria, right? So binary, like, is it included in the data set or no? So if I'm looking for, let's say, objects nearest to, you know, I love Asian food, so if I was looking on the map for restaurants like Asian food, that's, some, that's a vector search. It's a similarity search, right? But I don't want restaurants back home in Edinburgh or in Sydney. I might want something in Paris, and that's a particular criterion. So I want to look in my inverted index to match those, that criterion. But how do we make sure that those two things overlap? Because I don't want zero results, because if I catch you know, a bunch of restaurants in Edinburgh come up and none of, the filters, um, none of those filters match, well, that's no good. So one thing we can do is we can structure our vector search with filters such that we can make an um, allow list of whatever numbers that match my criterion. Could be you know, as small as 10, could be a millions or whatever. And then pass that to my vector search so that while it's traversing the network and finding the most similar objects, it'll just find or return the objects that match that criterion, right? So we can do that. We still have a little bit of room for improvement because the performance perhaps isn't ideal, and that's because the keyword index isn't ideal for this purpose, right? Remember, we talked about the keyword index having counts of tokens, right? And that information of how often they appear is extraneous to what we, gonna, what we want to do, right? We don't really care if they appear a lot. We just want to know if that's true or false. So one uh, optimization, as it turns out, is to use bitmaps for filtering like this. And we, in particular, use a compressed bitmap algorithm called Roaring Bitmaps, which is really, really cool. I don't have time to get into it at the moment, but I would encourage you to check it out if this is interesting to you. So that's filtering. Another cool thing you can do with these two indexes is hybrid search. So how that works under the hood is by performing two searches. You can perform a vector search, get some sort of a score out, perform a keyword search, get another score out. Why is this useful? Well, it turns out, I know I'm from a vector database company, it turns out this isn't really a story about one search being better than the other. They are very, very different tools. And at university, my lecturer used to always say there's always the right tool for the job, right? So it's really a story about using these complementary tools the right way. And if, as it turns out, if you perform these two searches under the hood and combine the top results of each, you get very, very good, robust search. And how do we do that quickly? Well, that's where the indexes come in, right? So this is a really good best of both worlds search strategy. Making good progress. We've made a lot of stuff in a you know, short amount of time got indexes. So we've got data store indexes, and now we can perform efficient searches and filtering, go through the indexes, go to our object store, pass the results back to the user. Great. We've kind of built a mini database already. So we can store data, perform fast searches and filters, but our user come back, comes back and says, okay, that's great. That's really good. Um, but how do I deal with having more data, having multiple data sets? and more end users. I'm building a SaaS product, right? How do I make sure that our end users can use this database? And hey, um, my computer crashes every so often, and that means downtime and so on. And these are really in production database type issues. So how do we solve those with a vector database? Well, what if each of these mini databases could be multiplied? Then we can add them across multiple devices. And this concept is, of course, sharding in distributed database. Again, not a new concept, but it solves a lot of issues in this context, and it's very, very useful. So each shard in a vector database has an object store, of course, a vector index, and our inverted indexes. So it can search, uh, perform keyword searches, perform filtering, and so on. And you can use these shards 
across different uh, nodes and whatever, or across you can combine multiple shards as part of one collection of objects. So you can horizontally scale them. You might even be able to serve one tenant, so that's an end user in our distributed SaaS or in our SaaS use case. So that each user's data is isolated and they can be compliant and so on. So you can perform easy onboarding, offboarding by just deleting a shard or creating a new shard for them. And if you create lightweight shards, you can really scale to thousands of nodes or tens of thousands of nodes per device, which is very, very handy. And this is a multi tenancy structure. Great, so we've got multi tenancy. And of course, we can also have clones of each of these shards for replication and reliability. And if you start having replication in distributed databases, if you're you know, aware of this field, it's a lot involved in making sure that the data remains consistent, data and the schema remain consistent, and so we can maintain them as we go forward. And how do we even scale up further than this? Well, the answer is to now start getting into placing these shards into some sort of hardware so that you can have a node that hosts multiple shards and that can also coordinate with other shards. And as to how you arrange these multiple nodes together, you have options. You can, of course, have a replication where each node is identical in your cluster, or you can combine them with horizontal scaling and so on. It's really infinitely scalable. So the question now becomes that of resource planning. So you might ask, us, you might ask yourself questions like, hey, well, how big uh, my vectors. What's my quantization strategy? How much of that trade-off in accuracy can I accept for the efficient uh, memory usage? How many objects am I going to have? Am I going to have hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions, or even billions, right? Because that determines your, your resource usage and even quantization strategy. And multi-tenancy, how isolated do my data sets need to be? And what's your repli uh, replica count? So how much reliability do you need? How much downtime can you tolerate, and so on. And you know, hardware details like actually how big are your nodes, and so on. But once you have those decisions, you can start to build out your infrastructure, and you can really place this in any sort of infrastructure you want. One thing we want, though, is this. Developer experience is something that perhaps doesn't go as said enough, but it is really crucial to getting your users to use the tool that you're building. And we haven't talked about where these vectors come from just yet, because I've said, oh, we get these vectors and objects, put them in the database, but what do they actually come from? The typical workflow looks something like this. The user sends your data to the, or the user sends their data, excuse me, to some sort of an embedding model, and they get vectors back. And you know, it's not a huge amount of code, whatever. And then you would have, they would do that and send the data and the embeddings into the vector database. But really, this is kind of a means to an end. It's not something that they care about that much, because how many of you actually look at the vectors when you get them back? I'm guessing not many. Thanks, Daniel. Um, <laughs> it's, they're just means to an end. They're just a series of numbers, and they don't in themselves mean anything to us humans. What if you could do this instead? All you want to do is to do something and build a database with these objects in it. What if you could have the database obtain those vectors in the background, and then the user doesn't have to worry about any of that? Sure, if they have embeddings already, that's great. We can reuse them. But otherwise, have the database get them, because it's an implementation detail, right? So what if you could have integrations with your model providers like Cohere, Google, and what have you? And once you have those integrations built up, from the user perspective, they don't need to worry about any of that. It's all under the hood details. And from the user perspective, it's just magic behind the curtain stuff. You know, it's a little bit like not having to build code in assembly or whatever these days. And it's the same thing in query. You can add or you can send queries to the database, and they can convert that into vectors and so on. So here's the other crucial piece, in our opinion, of what you might want in a vector database is integration with these model providers. Because what that means is from a user perspective, you don't need to worry about getting a lot of these details yourself. This is a, you don't need to see this code, but I just wrote this to demonstrate that if you are manually obtaining embeddings for your searches and your data insertions, what your code looks like is on the left. But with these integrations, this is actual code um, to 
you know, do a vector search on the right. And this is one of the reasons that people like using a um, platform because it's easy to use and that lets them build the stuff that they actually want to build and adds value to them. Cool. We built a lot. It's just been 25 minutes, so um, I can go back and tell our engineers that we've built a whole database in 25 minutes. It's great. So what have we built so far? We started with an object store, added indexes, and because we have these structures, we can perform filtering searches through our metadata with keyword searches and vector search, hybrid search, and so on. And to scale, we added those uh, mini databases or shards across to different parts of nodes. And to scale, of course, we would have replication of different nodes and horizontal sc horizontally scale multiple nodes across our cluster so we can place them across different uh, um, Sorry, I lost my place there. So we can horizontally scale them across different parts of our infrastructure. And as I just mentioned, these integrations are really there to abstract away these details that you might not care about as a developer, because at the end of the day, you're just trying to build things that add value to your business and your use case. And that's what our system looks like. And we've built a database in 26, 27 minutes or so. Um, so that was a run through of how to build or key what I think are key architectural components of a vector database in just over 20 somewhat minutes. Um, of course, there's a lot I haven't covered, so I will try to add some resources here. If you're looking to use a vector database and see what end applications exist, um, Verba is a great one for that. So that's our amazing growth team who's built an end-to-end -end RAG application. We've got we be at Academy, where we've got some end-to-end -end learning resources. We've got tons of workshops and blogs and so on, and we've got some social media um, links there. What I also wanted to do was this, because I touched on a lot of different really interesting components of a vector database. Um, what I'll do after this talk is to share some links to how HNSW works, what roaring bitmaps are, um, details of quantization, different, you know, be, um, getting into the weeds of how binary quantization and product quantization work, and more talks on internals of WebA, because yes, we've had the conceit of let's build a database in, you know, this amount of time, but of course there's only so much we can cover in that time. And if you think WebA is interesting, um, please scan the QR code and, and give it a trial as well. So yeah, that's it from me. Um, I don't want to hold you here. I didn't want to hold you too long before lunch and have uh, food or other projectiles thrown at me. But hopefully that was interesting. And I um, hope it's given you a great overview of what's inside a vector database and how that makes it different from other types of databases. Cool. Thanks very much. And if you have any questions. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, if you didn't hear the question, the question was how are the results of a vector search and keyword search combined? We actually have two at the moment, uh, what's called fusion algorithms as to how they're combined. Um, one is invert reciprocal ranked fusion. Sounds, uh, you know, very, very complicated, but all it is is we have two lists, right? So a vector search results list, um, hybrid search results list, and the uh, rank, you know, one, two, three, four, get inverted, summed, and then inverted again, right? So you get a, you get a rank. And what that tends to do algorithmically is it tends to capture ones that are at the top of at least one of them, right? So if something's at the top of both, they get ranked up very high. Um, but if something's very high in, say, keyword search, but not so much in vector search, that tends to end up higher than something that's kind of in the middle of both. So it does a really good job of, you know, being able to uh, capture one that's good in one or the other criterion. And intuitively, that's because they are very different search algorithms. So that tends to work well. Um, the other one is uh, score fusion, basically. So it's similar, but this one uh, takes the normalized score into account and they get summed. So it's not just using a rank, but it, it takes into account how close something is to the top score because it is it is normalized. Um, so that tends to be a little bit more sensitive to like, you know, if there's a big drop off in uh, in similarity score, let's say, 
between whatever sets of data. And the same thing with, you know, if your BM25 search score um, falls off at a certain set, um, it, it is more sensitive to that because it's not losing that information. Cool. And do you have a second question? Yeah, so the good and bad thing about a vector database is that it's similarity-based, so there's no hard threshold, there's no intrinsic threshold as to like what's a good result, right? And the scores depend on the model you used either. So, you know, because we, we get the question of like, oh, what threshold of similarity should I use? And the answer is there's no great answer for that. So there's a couple of things you can do. Um, one is, it's going to sound very, very basic, but you are quite often the domain expert, so you'll have a good idea of like what your similarity looks like if something is a good result and intuitively start to fall off, right? So you can use that to kind of determine your um, thresholds as to what to do. And the second part is I talked about um, EF as to the candidate list during the search, and that, that list, um, sorry, that search list size tends to be dynamic as to the top K result that the user is asking for. So, you, you know, if, you, if your, EF, your EF never ends up being smaller than the K results that it's um, going to return. But um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one because there's no hard, um, hard and fast rule as to what threshold is a good one. Another one you can do is kind of use a elbowing kind of method where, you know, if you see a drastic change in between groups of results, that might be a good threshold to cut off there. Cool. Uh, yep. Between a, a keyword search and vector search. Yeah, that's really good. Sorry. Oh, hybrid approach. Yeah. Um, so I think the trade-off is that if you know your use case supports one or the other, because hybrid search is a little bit fuzzy, as in we don't really know what's going to work, so we're going to kind of get results from both and combine them, right? And by nature, keyword search is great. It's very precise, right? So if you're looking for research, uh, if you're looking to search with particular keywords, let's say medical, legal terms, that works really well, right? If you're looking for case law, let's say, where this phrase was used and so on, that's when you would use keyword search. And semantic or vector search tends to be very, very fuzzy. Um, hybrid search works well when in real, you know, used uh, in production use cases where you don't really know what's going to work. And also, you don't know how the user is going to use it. I think that's the other reason hybrid search works really well is because you can't control what the user wants to do. And of course, there's a diverse range of users too. Um, so I think that's the trade-off. And then the downside of that, of course, is that you don't get to be as precise in controlling the kinds of output that come back because maybe, you know, in an ideal world, you want to tell your users to just use keyword searches and you can try and do that. But, you know, people make typos, people use different words, you have to play the synonym game and so on. Cool, I hope that helps. Uh, sorry, the gentleman here. Oh, that's a good question. I think one way to think about that is that when you when we have quantization, I talked about binary quantization, or uh, as I like to call it, I can't believe this works model. Um, the recall value, if you didn't compensate for that by overfetching and rescoring, is quite low, right? As you might imagine, because you're just turning a bunch of, you're compressing the data by 32 times. Um, but by overfetching and rescoring with the real vectors, that tends to help. And the fact that rescoring works means that the top-ish results are there, right? Because if they were completely randomized and jumbled, they wouldn't be in the top. Overfetching won't help you, really, right? Because the rescoring won't help you. Um, so I think that tells you that, you know, um, the loss of information isn't catastrophic by using binary quantization. But having said that, I think that tells you that if your embeddings weren't very good, there's only so much you can do, right? Um, and I think people see that when they use very general embedding models for very domain-specific things, and, and they just don't work as well. So 
again, it really tends to depend on what use case you have. And as domain uh, as a domain expert, you can you probably the only ones can get a qualitative sense of how well is this working. Um, when you're choosing an embedding model, we often recommend that you make your own validation data set, even if it's kind of small, so you can get an intuitive feel for how well it works. Um, you know, just like language models with embedding models, you don't know how much of recall of um, benchmark sets that the model's doing, because you can look at um, open source, you know, benchmarks for embedding models, but you don't know how much of that set doing recall of training data, right? Um, or sorry, benchmark data in, your, in its training set. So we recommend that people do their own evaluations to, to complement that. Cool, thank you. Um, there was a question at the, yeah. That's a good question. Um, can I ask what modalities you're dealing with? So the question was, what's a good strategy for multimodal data? What modalities are you dealing with? Okay. Um, I guess there's a couple of things you can do. One is to use a multimodal embedding model, right? Like uh, some sort of clip family or so on. And that's if you want to have a mixture of these um, meanings or <laughs> embeddings in the same vector space. Because if you don't know if you're gonna search by image or search by text or search images by text and so on. Another thing you can do is um, in many vector databases, in, including wev 8 you can have multiple embeddings per object. Right, so if you know, if you're, even if you have multimodal data, so movies is a good example, right? You might have movie posters, title, description, and so on. But if you know that you want to either search by image or search by text, then you can just switch between searching by different embedding models too. Um, because for each modality, they tend to work better. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps. Um, I, th I haven't seen one, like a benchmark. Um, that list has some comparison features because there are so many, it makes it easy. I think it depends on what features you want and what, um, one thing I talk about is like, I, you know, I talk about scalability and reliability a lot because what we see is that it's really easy these days to make this, you know, there's YouTube videos like build a rag app in 10 minutes kind of thing. And then you try and scale and that doesn't quite work. So that's why we talk about these types of issues. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind is like, what does my end goal and state look like? What features do I need to get there um, and work backwards from what features? Because it's fine to build a prototype to the POC, but then it might not be ideal to have to go back and choose a different solution for your production use case. Um, so, if, you know, that's why I mentioned multi-tenancy for SaaS cases and so on. And I guess it depends on um, if you're, you know, we talked about multi, uh, multi-modality, whether the database is able to support those modalities and integrations and different models, I think is a quite useful, useful tool. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, well, I think that's all the questions I have. We're around, um, so, you know, if you, if you see me, please say hello and, uh, Thank you very much for, for your time.